All right, welcome to Alimony. This is number nine. Ali, Mayor of New York. Thursday, October 12th, 2023. Here I am talking about what I would do if I was mayor of New York in some situation, or if I ran for mayor of New York. But here are some short thoughts. Today is an interesting day because it's the uh, 12th of the month. And the pandemic, uh, our official first day of the pandemic was March 12th, 2020. That was the lockdown for us in New York City as a business. Business began to slow down that March um, dramatically, especially the week beforehand, as the murmurs of the pandemic began. But March 12th, 2020 was the first day that we were officially asked to lock our doors and shut down by order of the governor of New York and the mayor of New York City. So March 12th is one of those days for me. You know, I'm old enough where December 7th, 1941, uh, Pearl Harbor is one of those days for me. Whenever December 7th comes, I'm always aware of that day. Uh, 9-11, of course, is another day for me. January 6th, which was the, um, the riots at the Capitol, I hope we don't get into a world where every day eventually is taken up by some event and that's all we're doing. We're marking 365 days by some tragedy or some horrific event. And that's what's happening in the world today, right now. Each day it's getting more and more challenging um, because we are a world at war. So today is the 43rd month anniversary of the March 12th lockdown uh, being October 12th. I try to write about it in a Google Doc that I have that I started writing in um, at the beginning of the pandemic. I just needed to make sense of it as we began to realize we may not be able to save these businesses. And ultimately, there were four businesses, um, three in New York and one in North Carolina that we weren't able to save. And when March 12th, 2020 happened, we never never reopened those businesses again. So, as I said, I have a, a soft spot or an understanding for what it's like to run bricks-and-mortar businesses in New York City as a tenant, how difficult it is. I remember when Hurricane Sandy happened and we were shut down for a week, uh, how much that exposed our underbelly, our soft underbelly as a business. Because if you have one week of making no money, but you still have to pay all the other fixed costs, you realize how vulnerable you are as a business. And for us, when March 12th, 2020 happened, by the end of the month, by the end of March, um, some of those businesses, I realized I just don't know how we save them. One of them was $40,000 a month rent, another was $25,000 a month rent, and at that point, the landlords had already basically said that they were not gonna forgive rent, um, that was at the beginning of it. Um, ultimately, one landlord said, look, if you, you know, we'll give you a 20% discount if you pay rent for uh, April 1st. And at that point, we realized 20% discount was still going to put our rent at 32000 And we just didn't know where we were going to go with this pandemic or how long it was going to last. So at that moment, we realized we just, we have to lock it all down. And we have to simply pay what we have to pay, and that's insurance. We have to pay insurance, um, maintain that. Um, but aside from that, everything else was on hold until we figured out what happened. And my gosh, it seems like a lifetime ago now. Um, and the city is reopened, and it's bustling. But unless you have a real sense in small business what it was like pre-COVID, I don't know if it's quite possible to realize it's not the same. You know, you go to Penn Station in the morning, there's not as many people coming in or leaving. Mondays and Fridays, it seems like people do not come in. If those people are going back to the office, maybe it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Places where there used to be long lines to get lunch, there's not as many people waiting to get something to eat or get coffee. People are back, and I'm sure everybody wants to think it's over, but... There's a lot of challenges in New York City right now. And as I said, I, uh, the series Alimony, if I was mayor of New York, Ali, mayor of New York, I don't want to be mayor of New York, really. 
Um, but I do, and I thought about this the other day, I would like to be somebody who encourages New York, motivates it, makes us realize that we're all in this together, the five boroughs, that if the sun comes up, when the sun comes up, if you're in one of the five boroughs, as the sun comes up, you're in New York City, you're a New Yorker. And it's up to you to be part of the solution or part of the problem. And I think I would like to be someone who motivates New York, encourages it, realizes how lucky we are to be in this city. Being mayor of New York, I'm sure, would have a lot of challenges because there's some things like ah, only money will fix. And does New York have the money to deal with the migrant crisis right now? Does it have money to deal with the homeless crisis? And where does money ultimately come from for a, for a city? Property tax, fees, licensing fees, um, permits, violations, tickets. I'm sure there's other revenue streams for a city too, but you just can't manufacture money out of nowhere. And as I've said previously, I think New York should be in the business of New York, meaning potentially starting a movie studio that makes New York films. Now, would that bring in enough or would that just be negligible? And would it be too much of a headache? And would it ultimately lead to who's making these movies? Who's casting them? Who's making these TV shows and casting them so that the money goes into the coffers of New York City? Do we make New York City merch or are we already doing it? Does New York City already have a robust merch um, business? Are we potentially taking all the New York City street signs and saying, you know what, let's sell these off in a online auction and get new street signs so that every corner has a street sign on all four corners. They're larger. You can see the, the number of the street or the name of the street. Do we sell off all our old garbage cans on the corner, which seem dated and beaten up and abused? And do we get new futuristic garbage cans? And I'm sure if you put the New York City garbage cans on eBay, you would have people all over the world who would say bid for them in order to have a New York City garbage can in their neighborhood, at their house. I mean, it's still a New York City garbage can. But I think we have to look for ways to treat New York City like a business and realize that New York City has value in and of itself as a city. And how do we use that value of the city to generate revenues? Um, and refurbish, whether it's our buses, whether it's our trains, do we sell off our trains to other cities that can use them? Can they be used to update the train system? Um, but ultimately there are so many people in politics, you know, in New York City politics, and there's so many people running it. There's plenty of people who are professional politicians, and I'm not a politician. I have never run for office at any level, really. Um, I, I guess I was, I was a high school athlete. I, I put my time and energy into some sports. Um, I, friendships, hanging out, but I don't know why. And I guess to some degree, it may have had something to do in an underlying way that I'm an immigrant. And at some point I realized I couldn't be president of the United States and so at some point, maybe that affected my desire to get into politics at all, because if you can't be president of the United States, what's the point? I think not only that we should have a path to citizenship for people, we should also have that path from citizenship to the presidency. Because if you've got a group of people who are living in your country who know they can never be president, that has an effect on them. Because they know there is a job that says to them, no need to apply. We won't even look at your application. So go elsewhere if you want a job because the, the, the mayor of New York City is a job and you work for the people of New York and those are the people who can fire you or hire you. And so if there's a job, the mayor of New York, and you can't apply, you might feel disenfranchised. You might feel detached. You might as a child go, I don't care. If I can't be president of the United States, then forget about it. So I think at some point, you know, it took a long time for women to get the right to vote. And from the first um, conventions they had at Seneca Hall, um, where women began the, uh, the process officially to try to get the right to vote, I believe it took 90 years. You know, in this country, you know, the beginnings of it, there was a cognitive dissonance. 
you know, to be able to say life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and all men are created equal, yet the people who were creating this and the architects of the Constitution um, had slaves. So there must have been some level of blindness to it. How can we say, and, and that nobody stood up and said, how can we say all men are created equal if African Americans are slaves? and women don't have the right to vote. How can we say that? Did anybody even think of this? Or was, were they so blinded that in their mind, it wasn't even something to think about? They're like, well, what, are, what are you talking about? Well, you've written in here, all men are created equal. Shouldn't we say all humans are created equal? See, at that point, there wasn't even enough of uh, what they would call now wokeness or being awake to say, you know, instead of saying all men are created equal, because people would probably say, well, by men, we mean everybody. But I mean, it just, that's the way we speak right now. We say all men are created equal as opposed to all humans. But they probably think if you brought up, well, should we say this? Should we say all men are created equal except for slaves and women and immigrants? And they go, what are you talking about? Well, we don't mention that in this. We just say all men are created equal. Right. We're talking about all Caucasian white men. So there has to be a cognitive dissonance to some degree. Um, but I, I believe at some point, it most likely will not be in my lifetime, but eventually in the next 50 to 100 years, um, someone who is born in another country will be able to run for the presidency of the United States. I'm sure they'll add other criterion, meaning like you have had to have lived here for 35 years, you know, but ultimately, if you can get elected president of the United States, it, it's that is a tough, tough, long haul. And if the people have voted for you, it means in their hearts. And again, I, I believe any election for the presidency is going to be 51, 49 at best. I don't see a 55 percent, 45 percent thing happening. And I think as you find more splintering and become three parties, I think you're going to find, you know, eventually it's going to get to 33, 33, 34. But if you have to win by majority, eventually it'll be a runoff between two people and you have to have more than half the votes. That could be a roadblock. But as an immigrant, as someone who was born in another country, I was born in Esfahan, Iran, in the fall of 1968. We came here in the summer of 69 when I was nine months old. I could not run for the presidency. And so, to some degree, that may have affected my desire to be in politics in any way. Because it's like playing Monopoly, but you know you can't win. You're not allowed to win this game of Monopoly. You can play with us, and you can do a lot of stuff in the Monopoly board, but you just can't win. And I guess in Monopoly, you'd have to be, you'd be able to play, but you couldn't purchase any hotels or houses. You could just keep going around and around and around, but when you landed on a hotel, you wouldn't be allowed to buy it. When you landed on a uh, piece of property, you wouldn't be able to put uh, a house there. Oh my gosh, yes, there's a guy now. Um, you might hear that in the background. I think he's, there's some mental illness, but he goes around and just poorly plays a trumpet. Um, and he just blows this horn. I guess it's his cry for help. And you may or may not be able to hear it because of the recording system that I'm using because I'm right at the mic. Um, and you may be able to hear it, but that's New York City. New York City has become noisier, louder, because I believe there is to some degree a certain amount of insecurity in capitalism, where almost no matter who you are, you just don't know when the other shoe is going to drop. How am I going to end up not be able to, being able to make ends meet? There's just more fear, I think, than there ever was before because the stakes are getting higher in terms of rent, insurance, health insurance, um, electrical needs, phone bills. I mean, I grew up in a time, and I'm old enough, and I was thinking about this the other day. I'm very grateful that I've lived in a time in, this, in history where there was one phone in the kitchen with a short cord to now where you have a cell phone, you can talk to someone anywhere in the world. What I've seen happen, I've, I've seen phones change, I've seen televisions change, I've seen water change in terms of you got your water out of a tap, if you wanted water during the day, if you were playing sports, you carried a thermos, you filled it with water, that was your water, you didn't buy bottles of water. 
So I think this period of time from like the 60s when I was born and seeing it till now, the, you know, mid 2020s and beyond. And I don't know how much longer I'll be here, but already things are happening at an exponential rate where who knows what happens with AI. One thing I was thinking about, though, for debate, and I and I have a pair of socks that I, I love these socks, Thorlo socks that I, I wear. Um, they're military socks. Thorlo is a company that makes socks out of Statesville, North Carolina. And I'm from North Carolina, a great company. But, you know, at some point, these socks, you can wear them for a while. A, ho- a hole appears in the toe, you know. And so when that happens and your toe is sticking out of the hole in your sock, it's humbling. You know, it, 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 it in a way uh, makes you feel like there's a, used to be cartoons of what was at one point in the 1920s or 30s called hobos. And when they represented the hobos, whenever they took their shoe off, there was also always a hole in their big toe where their toe was sticking out. And that's how you knew they were a hobo because their socks need darning. I thought it'd be interesting if when they do debates for any political office, especially the presidency, that the people up there should have one shoe and sock on, and then the other foot is no shoe, one sock, but that sock has a hole in the big toe for their big toe to stick out. So while they're up there, we can always remember they're exposing themselves with a certain bit of vulnerability. Because when your big toe is sticking out of a hole in your sock, I don't know what it is, but it just makes you feel vulnerable. You know, you want to get that hole fixed. You want to be protected. And I think we should find ways for those people who get up and debate and speak in front of us to humble themselves as opposed to they're wearing the nicest socks, the nicest shoes. They've put on this outfit. They've decided they've tested it. They've done camera shoots. They've done tests. What's the best colored tie? What's the best colored dress? What's the best outfit for me to wear up there? Um, Because it's all branding in some way. But if one of the contingencies was you have to have an exposed big toe, um, let's just say your left foot has no shoe on, you're wearing socks, and uh, you got a big toe sticking out. I think it would also be interesting if we did debates, and some debates were no shoes and no socks. So you can be in a suit, you can be in a dress, but you'd be barefoot up there. You'd be barefoot. Um, and I guess you could take it as far as you want. You could put, you know, sand down or grass down. So they have to stand on sand or stand on grass, but anything to kind of humanize people, you know, to tap into some level of authenticity. Um, because I think there's something about being barefoot that brings us back to childhood potentially and summers and we're all the same and okay, they are who they are and they, they represent what they represent, but they're barefoot. You know, there's a big grounding movement of people walking around um, barefoot in grass to ground themselves to the earth. Uh, and I think any opportunity you get to take your shoes and socks off and walk around barefoot in the grass or the sand, I mean, it's what a feeling. If I could, if I could live by the beach and teach like tennis and maybe yoga, yoga to people who are like older or heavier and tennis to people who are starting out or junior high level. I mean, I think, you know, once you get to, I mean, I could probably hit with someone who's a high school level who's starting out, but I mean, you know, and I could definitely, you know, feed them balls and, you know, hit balls to them and, you know, help them with their serve. And I think, you know, serving is the, to me, the biggest shot in tennis. And I think it needs to be practiced as much as anything. Uh, I think sometimes people don't realize the power of that first serve. I'm getting off track a little bit again, but what does this have to do with being mayor of New York? I guess my love of tennis would be trying to bring something like tennis to all New Yorkers and finding and doing essentially um, recruiting. You know, how do you take all the kids that are out there when they're young and find out, let's find a sport for you, right? First and foremost, we want to make sure you can read, read out loud, write, um, public speak and do some arithmetic and my platform is simple you know clean streets safe streets free streets so the goal is to keep everything as simple as possible but we need to help kids find like what are you interested in and some kid may go I'm interested in video games okay okay right we all love video games we love devices but let's find some ways where you know how to change a light bulb 
You know how to, a light bulb is broken inside a socket. How can you safely take it out of there? Um, you know, even things that I'd like to be able to be more adept at changing a light switch. Um, but what are basic things that young folks can learn how to do where, you know, they're changing the, the, the lock on a door, on a doorknob, um, basic sheetrock work. There's a hole in their house painting, um, whether you're using blue tape to tape it up and paint or you're painting by hand, but these become skills. And if kids at a young age can find like, Oh, I really enjoy this. And I think we have to go back to a place in schools where there is one period a day where kids get to find out, Hey, I have an aptitude for painting. I have an aptitude for electrical work or welding or sheetrock or plumbing. Um, basic stuff. I mean, I, I don't know if it has to be every day, but if you show every child how to like, this is your toilet. Here's how it works. Here's how you change the stopper. Here's what happens when it clogs up. It's a big deal. I mean, when I get up in the middle of the night and I have to go to the bathroom, I try to go to the bathroom with gratitude. Thank you for my legs. Thank you for the ability to be able to stand on my own two feet. Thank you for this hole in this ground that I can just go and flush and I don't have to deal with it. Because I have lived in New York during a, um, uh, a power outage um, in, a, in a situation where there was a building that collapsed in my neighborhood so all the plumbing was shut off for like four or five days. And what we didn't realize at the time is that you, you think, oh, I can't go number two, um, a bowel movement, but I can urinate. And because that's just going to sit there. But what you don't realize is when you urinate in a toilet and it can't flush, the smell of that urine becomes so sickly sweet after a day or two that it's toxic. So I think we take for granted the ability to have a bathroom and go and flush and it's done. And so I think we have to approach, you know, how would you lead a, a city, a people? As I said, I would try to lead through empathy. I would try to lead through humility. And I would like to lead through gratitude, you know, instilling in New York City gratitude that, look, we live in this amazing city. We want to make sure that we are looking after the least of us, those who need the most help, those who need help because... They need to get down to the subway because they're in a wheelchair or they're older or they have a, uh, an issue. They're on crutches to make sure those who, you know, given what talents they have mentally or physically are still able to have some work where they're doing something where they're feeling like they're being of service to the city. Because I do believe that, that happiness comes from being of service to others. Um, I believe the road to happiness is paved with bricks of gratitude. So I think if people are being of service to others, they're going to feel more grateful. I'd like to think that people would rather do something to make something to buy something than just be given something. Um, as opposed to here's a card and we just upload this card with money. You know, I, I'd like to think that. But again, it's a matter of finding what do they like to do. And that starts out in a broader sense in terms of like, Someone may like to be around hospital environs. So, okay, they want to find a job in the medical field, whether that's working at a hospital, whether that is working um, as an EMT, which I was an EMT in South Orange Rescue Squad in North Carolina. In Carborough in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, some people call it Chapel Borough, because I wanted to find out if I wanted to be a doctor. And after a year of being on that ambulance, over 500 hours of service, I realized that I just wanted to be a doctor on TV. And I got a chance to do that numerous times in television, film, and plays, soap operas. I got to be a doctor. But at that time, it just wasn't in my wheelhouse to think I could be a doctor on television. So I thought I had to be a real doctor. And I think it's important for people to find out and separate the noise and find out what do they really want to do. If money doesn't matter, what comes easy to you but is difficult for others, and what would you do if money didn't matter? And instilling this kind of philosophy in our children of New York City and our citizens. And that's why I say, you know, I don't necessarily want to be mayor of New York or a politician. But I would love to find a way where we help to bring out the promise and potential in every New Yorker, which hopefully would lead to everybody living in New York State, which would hopefully lead to everyone living in the tri-state area, the East Coast, North America, and then the world. Because right now, we are lost at the world. And all we know how to do is fight and go to war. And without, you know, 
mentioning too much so that these recordings, you know, remain fairly evergreen. There's two major wars going on right now. That's not even including all the minor wars that are under 10,000 people fighting each other. And the skirmishes. Skirmishes are, you know, between 1 and 99 people is a skirmish. So there are skirmishes all over the war, war, world. There are wars going on. And there are major wars going on where hundreds of thousands of people have died in the name of war. They were sent to other nations to enslave them, to take their land. You know, as I've said, I don't mind if you want to send people to another nation... Send them there with farm implements to help them with their fields, to help them build houses, to help them build structures. Because ultimately, I think we all want the same thing. We want to make sure that our family and friends are safe, that we have a decent place to live, access to clean water, clean air, clean food, bathrooms, um, shower. I don't think we... We need to make it as complicated as we do. Unfortunately, we live in a time where money and status and prestige and brands have brainwashed us to a level where we think a watch or a purse or a car defines who we are. Now, I'm not saying those things aren't and can't be beautiful and have value, but I think we have to make sure everyone's got the basic needs first. Now, again, someone might hear this and go, you're talking socialism or you're talking communism. No, I am a capitalist. I would like to think that I'm hopefully to some degree a conscientious capitalist or a caring capitalist, but I'm still a capitalist. I'm a micro venture capitalist, um, a micro, um, you know, uh, a venture capitalist micro venture capitalist, I guess you'd say, you know, the projects that I do are not in the level of, you know, a VC, you know, a venture capitalist putting in hundreds of millions of dollars into something or 10 million or 20 million or 50 million, but trying to do little projects that I still enjoy doing things that we're working on right now. Little books, websites, t-shirts, hats, you know, um, this podcast, Alimony, which I believe this is the ninth one. And as I've said, I'm going to keep these short. I'm going to try to keep these under uh, a half hour each just so I can get to know myself. People can get to know me and maybe somebody goes, hey, I don't know about you being mayor, but I heard what you said. I like your idea and I'm going to take it and I'm going to try to, as a council person, focus on clean streets. And I think we can do that by figuring out how do we paint the mailboxes to begin with. How do we make those into canvases and art projects? How do we paint the fire hydrants? I mean, because it's really pretty basic when you look at a street. It's the mailboxes. There's usually on our street, there's four. There's two on our side, two on the other side of the street, 29 between 6 and 7. There's some fire hydrants. And again, just making sure they're painted bright red, easiest colors, right? So they pop like Technicolor. And then there's just cleaning up the garbage. And then you've got to deal with like cracks in the street and holes. And that's, I believe, up to the landlord. But it's up to the city to make sure the landlords make sure they own the building, that the concrete out front is smooth and there's no trip hazards because the trip hazards will cause slip and trip lawsuits towards the city. So we have to mitigate those by saying, look, you own the building. You've got to figure out a way. You may be land rich, cash poor, meaning you own the building, but you don't have any money to do anything with the building. Well, you might have to borrow money to fix your sidewalk because the city can't go around fixing everybody's sidewalk. The city has to take care of the streets, which we have to make a real effort to make sure the streets are as smooth as we can make them to be. But as I said, I want to keep these short. I don't want to make them too long. I want to give people a chance to, who is this guy? What's he talking about? Ali? Alimony? Again, it comes from Ali, A-L-I, Mayor of New York. Um, and I know alimony is a very emotional topic, so, you know, I hope no one has come here to discuss alimony. Um, but I hope, you know, with these conversations, with these different ideas, and some may be repetitive, that people realize that, you know, I love New York City. And I want the best for New York City. And I think it's a great city. It's got so much to offer, and it is, I believe, the hope of the free world, that we've all come here from around the world to hopefully live in peace and harmony and work. 
I love New York City and I hope New York City loves me. And I hope you got something out of this. 